So I'm going to begin today by just saying a few very impressionistic uh, things about the historical background uh, to a lot of uh, debates about philosophical method, about, in fact, about both the aims and the methods uh, of uh, philosophy. And, uh, and this has uh, to do uh, with philosophy and the scientific uh, revolution, uh, which is something that's often not made uh, explicit uh, in these uh, discussions. But I think it, it's it, it's there as an implicit uh, presence, and uh, I think it makes better sense of of quite a lot of the uh, the ways things have gone. I'm I'm going to be talking in a very big picture way. I'm 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 not going to try to to be historically very uh, nuanced, but I th- I think the big picture is important. Um, so. I think in the long run, the the scientific uh, revolution of the 17th and 18th centuries uh, caused a gradually intensifying crisis of aims and methods uh, in uh, philosophy. Um, and... And that's the background that we need to understand. I, I don't think it was something that, as it were, developed very quickly, but I think it, as it were, gradu- gradually became uh, more and more uh, pressing. Um, so, so one thing that happened in that uh, period w- was that the the distinction emerged that we we now make between. Um, philosophy and natural science, but in in the early period and even in the up to the 18th century what we would now call natural science was called uh, natural uh, philosophy in English and corresponding terms in other languages um, but it, it gradually uh, diverged uh, from uh, philosophy in the way that it proceeded and fr- from philosophy in a narrower sense uh, something more like the modern sense and um, and what had been called natural philosophy and so reg- regarded as a branch of philosophy uh, later became known as uh, natural science and f- was thought of as something uh, quite disjoint uh, from philosophy. Now, the, the crisis that I- I'm talking about um, has been um, worst for metaphysics, as metaphysics is the, as it were, the, looks like the most problematic branch of philosophy in this respect, uh, because it seems to be in the most competition with with natural science. Um, so they both seem to be aiming to give a very general description of the world, uh, but metaphysics seems to have no methods that would compete with the new sciences, uh, experiments and um, experiments and observations, and so on. Um, but and so it looked as though, as it were metaphysics was trying to answer the same questions as um, the natural sciences, in particular as as physics. Um, but just doing it by, as people say, sitting in an armchair and, and thinking about uh, how the, uh, the world must be, rather than um, going to the world and, te- and interacting with it and finding out uh, how it uh, actually uh, is. And, and so um, it, was, it was danger of metaphysics looking like the so where the lazy man's um, physics, where we, we didn't really bother to do the experiments that are needed. And so it seemed that metaphysics was um, going into competition with, with natural science, um, but a competition that it was bound to lose because it simply didn't have the high-powered new methods of uh, the developing natural sciences. Uh, 
And I think that that crisis also affected other branches of philosophy, though perhaps not in quite such um, a a direct way. Um, And as I say, as natural science became more and more separate from philosophy and more and more successful, uh, the uh, the crisis uh, became worse. I mean, not a crisis in the sense of one, as it were, a moment of crisis, but that's something that a, a, a problematic challenge for philosophy that has become more and more uh, severe. Um, so I, I think the case of um, geometry, even though it's re- technically a branch of mathematics, um, rather than um, philosophy, but uh, it, I think the, the methodological questions that it raised are, are worth thinking about um, in, in, this, uh, in this light. And, uh, and they, they had some implications for what people believed could be achieved by, as it were, the, the kind of armchair methods or uh, a priori reflection typical of uh, philosophy. So, uh, for a very long time, Euclidean geometry uh, seemed like a case where a priori reflection, um, just as in philosophy, had yielded uh, significant knowledge of physical space by allowing us to make uh, deductions from uh, self-evident uh, axioms. Uh, and and this was a, a model that was quite... Uh, influential in um, areas of philosophy, um, and you know, I, I think a classic case of of that uh, is um, Spinoza uh, in the Ethics, uh, who who tried to apply the Euclidean methodology to uh, ethics, uh, and I mean that's very explicit in, in the uh, sort of structure that he, that he gives with this kind of imitation of. Euclid's uh, geometry, um, and and I think that was because it it could still look that as though um, Euclidean geometry um, was a kind of paradigm of of how we could gain this kind of knowledge by by as I say finding some uh, axioms that would be self evident to reflection and then drawing out uh, in um more and more extended ways the the consequences of those axioms um and and that that knowledge seemed to be um very non trivial um very substantial even if physical space was not constitutively independent of our experience so even if you think of physical space um as uh, something that in some way represents the the structure of our experience rather than the structure of uh, the world as it is in itself. Uh, it still the, the, would be the case it seems, that that Euclidean uh, geometry would be very um, substantial uh, knowledge of uh, that space. Um, but you know, famously, the the nineteenth century. Um, Discovery but, um, by various mathematicians of consistent non-Euclidean uh, geometries, where the the parallels postulate was denied, um, they undermined the a priori arguments uh, for physical space being Euclidean because um, that the axiom that was the postulate was that was denied. Um, as it were, it, it seemed not totally self-evident, and th- these these non-Euclidean geometries did not get into any kind of uh, contradiction, as as were as people had hoped um, they would. Um, now, of course, or- originally these non-Euclidean geometries were, as it were, something of a, a mathematical uh, exercise. Um, but but then the problem became much worse when the scientific evidence uh, emerged through the work of Einstein and others that uh, physical space or actually space time itself is non Euclidean. So that it, um, it's not just that um, 
a an alternative to Euclidean geometry seems to be, as we're logically consistent, but there's actually evidence that it is in fact uh, correct, and therefore that Euclidean geometry is not only uh, it's not just that it's not logically compelling, but it is a, it's not even true of physical space or space time. Um, now, you know, if we fast, fast forward to the the situation uh, today, um, it, it's that uh, if we think of geometry as a part of um, mathematics, um, it's still in a loose sense a priori. It's done by standard mathematical methods, but it, it isn't understood as studying physical space in the sense of as it were, it's making claims which are responsible to the actual structure of physical uh, space. Um, I mean, instead, we, we've got various um, axioms for different kinds of geometry, um, which uh, can be studied just as abstract uh, formulas whose consequences can be drawn out by, by logical mathematical uh, reasoning, um, but which are not required to be interpreted in terms of uh, physical space or, or space-time. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a branch of uh, mathematics whose methodology uh, is uh, the, the pretty similar to that of other branches of mathematics. And it's, it's really just looking at um, taking the axioms to define various classes of uh, of structures, and then it's uh, proving theorems about what holds in uh, all structures of that kind, that, I mean, results of that sort. Um, whereas if, if we want to study what physical space or space-time uh, is like, then that study is going to be a posteriori, it's going to um, involve uh, actual experiments, and uh, and it will be a part of uh, physics, uh, not part of uh, mathematics, strictly speaking. So, I mean, the idea of Euclidean geometry as a kind of um, paradigm of how a priori reflection could yield substantial uh, knowledge of how the world is that that idea has um, collapsed. And as well, since although this geometry wasn't itself regarded as part of philosophy, but it was, as in the case of Spinoza, it was a kind of inspiration for um, philosophers who were looking for the the most rigorous ways to uh, proceed. Um, I think another aspect uh, of the way in which the um, the scientific revolution has um, impacted on philosophy concerns uh, the, what we now call the philosophy of mind. Um, so, you know, you might think, well, if, if we can't use our a priori uh, reflective methods uh, to study how the external uh, world is structured, we might still be able to, to use those methods to investigate how the uh, internal world of the mind uh, is structured. Um, and so you can see various kinds of attempts to, to um, think of philosophy uh, that, that way, which, of course, already involves um, a huge scaling down of philosophy's um, aims and uh, ambitions if it's not going to try to uh, investigate the external world that is just concerned with uh, our, own, our own minds or our um, um, but, but even thinking of philosophy as a, a kind of a priori investigation of the, the mind, uh, it eventually faced a similar threat from the development of experimental psychology in the 19th century. I mean, so it, it, experimental philosophy, psychology, it diverged um, from uh, philosophy uh, much, much later. 
um, than uh, than physics and uh, some of the other natural sciences uh, did. But and, and it was really in the nineteenth century, not not the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, that 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 uh, happened. Um, and in, in fact, when when I was uh, my first teaching, uh, my first teaching job was in Trinity College Dublin in in Ireland, and um, and I was um, part of. I mean, the philosophy was part of the school of mental and moral science, and the and the mental science there had originally, uh, I think, been uh, psychology in effect, but but that had had separated uh, from philosophy, but but much more recently than. Um, than the, than physics and biology had separated from philosophy, for example. Um, so again, it, it seemed like um, philosophy was competing with a natural science, and or if you like, a social science. If you think of psychology that way, um, at a methodological disadvantage, because um, the um, the psychologists were doing, uh, as it were, proper experiments. Um, Whereas the the philosophers were not. I mean, actually, someone like David Hume. I mean, described um, what he was doing in effect in what we might now call philosophy of mind, or but which was to some extent psychology as using an experimental method. But the the experiments that he was doing were, were I mean, they were very uh, unsystematic and uh, sort of introspective uh, ones by comparison with. Um, what a lot of uh, psychology uh, was doing, although of course the introspectionist psychology was a big thing in the late nineteenth century, but but it was but it was doing the kind of experiments uh, that you needed a, a laboratory to do rather than uh, the, as were well the kind that a philosopher might do in their study. Um, so. I mean, one way of um, thinking of the the challenge that this uh, posed to philosophy uh, in general um, is apparent competition w w with the natural sciences is uh, a kind of potential mismatch uh, between philosophy's traditional aims and its traditional methods. That the the, um, the traditional uh, aims seem to be to, as it were, to get um, knowledge of how the world is in its um, broad uh, structure, um, or perhaps how some aspects of the uh, the world uh, are. Um, but then it looked as though the kind of um, methods of uh, philosophy, which were the, seemed to be Broadly, the kind that you can just apply sitting in an armchair. That that those traditional methods of a, a priori reflection did not seem um, appropriate by a comparison with those of the uh, the natural sciences, including psychology here, um, to the kind of questions that were being raised. I mean, that at least that the methods of um, Sciences that were using measurement and um, experimentation seem much more appropriate, um, and and so of course uh, th that raised the question: um, it, Well, if if philosophy's um, traditional um, a priori approach is not really good for answering those questions, what is it good for? And um, of course, we, we could also just take the view that we should um, just abandon uh, philosophy um, as uh, an obsolete uh, discipline, um, just stop doing it and maybe join the natural scientists, um, or that we should keep the methods of philosophy, we should still keep doing philo philosophy as we've traditionally done it, but just try to, to redefine our aims so that uh, the um, the methods that we're using are better adapted to those uh, aims. So, it, I mean, a slightly strange idea, idea that, in a way, we should carry on much as before, but just um, redefining um, 
which race we're we're running in, um, and uh, and so it, it you know it has seemed to various people um, that that philosophy might simply be um, an obsolete discipline. Um, I I remember um, once again, actually, when I was in my first teaching job at, at Trinity College Dublin, where um, a, a a biochemist there once uh, uh, asked me whether many uh, British uh, universities still had a, a philosophy department. So he, he was thinking of a philosophy department as some kind of uh, obsolete uh, survival that 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 he was thinking most British universities might have um, abolished, but because the the force of uh, history and tradition and inertia was stronger in in Dublin that the, somehow a philosophy department had anomalously uh, survived there. So that as well, that's that's the way in which um, philosophy can look scarily uh, obsolete to to some natural scientists. Um, so so I think under this kind of uh, pressure. Um, in the 20th century, a number of philosophers um, thought of much more radical uh, revision of um, the postulated aims of philosophy. And in fact, in effect, to cease to regard philosophy as as fundamentally aiming at knowledge uh, at all. And if it's not aiming at knowledge, then it's presumably... Uh, it's not uh, competing with science. Of course, I'm assuming here that that's, in some broad sense, science does aim at knowledge. Um, but I think if, if the aims of science were redefined in terms of some other cognitive state, then there would be a corresponding claim amongst these radical revisionists that philosophy doesn't aim at that state, whatever it is that uh, the natural sciences aim at. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the question is, uh, well, if philosophy doesn't aim at knowledge, what does it aim at? If it's not aiming at, at the same kind of thing as the, the sciences aim at, what, what does it aim at? Um, so one way that we might get to a proposed answer is by thinking that, uh, of course, uh, on the sort of view that we're talking about, I mean, knowledge if we're thinking of that as the aim of the uh, the sciences, um, it's still expressed uh, in a language because it has to be communicated, as we were t talking about in the, the previous lecture. Um, and I'm at least in the case of propositional knowledge, by, and by propositional knowledge, I mean knowledge that something is the case. Um, and and then the picture might be um, that that language can express knowledge because it's rule governed. Um, that it, it, that's why it, uh, uh, or how it, it has the necessary um, structure uh, and as a discipline to be capable of expressing scientific knowledge. Um, and then you might think, well, if if the language um, has these rules which enable it to express knowledge, then whose job is it to, to look after the rules of the knowledge, to make sure that as where the, the rule book is uh, sufficiently clear and that it's being properly applied and so on. And putting it very crudely, the proposal might be that it, it's philosophy's job to look after the rules of the language. It's not philosophy's job as it were to um, use the rule governed language then to express knowledge it's it's that they they keep the uh the language in um a a working state where it's capable of, of expressing language in the first uh, of expressing knowledge in the first place and i mean again speaking in a very crude broad brush way but both um, rudolf carnap and and ludwig wittgenstein had versions of uh this idea i mean versions with different flavors, but, the, but there was also something in common between uh, the way that they were approaching. Of course, Carnap was much more interested in um, 
in scientific uh, language and Wittgenstein in ordinary language. But but some of some of I mean there was some commonality between their their views. Um, so what I'm going to to do um, is to in the next um, section of the the uh, lecture I'm going to be just giving a, a sketch of the kind of views that that you might get um, within this uh, approach and I'm which I'm calling as using um, the the traditional phrase the the, uh, the linguistic uh, turn um, so. So one version of this would would be that um, when philosophers make what seem like uh, factual statements, as when which things which look look like factual statements, uh, they're not really making factual statements at all. They're really just expressing uh, linguistic uh, rules, um, and then we can make a distinction within such expression, uh, which corresponds to a distinction between um, two kinds of metaphysics, which uh, Peter Strawson makes uh, in the, the preface to his um, book, Individuals. Uh, he he, make, he dis distinguishes between descriptive metaphysics and revisionary metaphysics, but we can apply this uh, distinction uh, more broadly. Um, so the idea is that uh, descriptive philosophy um, expresses rules that are already in force in the language. Whereas a revisionary uh, philosophy proposes new rules uh, to be put uh, into force. Uh, and certainly as um, Strawson was thinking of it, the, the, um, he, he thought that insofar as the, um, the new rules um, were supposed to um, replace the old rules um, that they were straying into into nonsense. Um, but but that I mean you you could you could be more open to uh, revisionary proposals um, than Strawson uh, was and still make make this distinction. In, in fact, I think I mean Carnap's an example of of someone who. Um, was was very open to um, all sorts of uh, combinations of rules, but I mean they would they would only replace the old rules in the sense of in his view that uh, that for some practical purpose we decided to speak a language with the new rules um, rather than the language with the old rules. It wouldn't be that the old rules were somehow false, um, and and so a, a sort of classic example of this approach is. Uh, with the the statement, let's say, made by a, a Platonist uh, in the philosophy of mathematics, that there are numbers, which it, it looks uh, like a statement such as a scientist might, might make, let's say, that there are uh, black swans. Um, <clears throat> but on, on Carnap's uh, view, in, insofar as a, a anything uh, substantial is, is happening uh, here, what's what's going on is is really a proposal to uh, to speak a language um, where it's one of the um, the rules of the language that that uh, we can we can correctly um, utter the sentence that, that there are numbers something like uh, like that. Uh, it, it's it's not uh, a statement about what there is as it were to be found in the world. Um, now, just just to um, to comment on the terminology, which uh, so the um, when we have such an apparent statement which expresses the rules uh, in force in a given language, um, that will count be, uh, will be called. Uh, with respect to that language, a conceptual uh, truth or an analytic truth in in a rather broad sense of analytic, which is now common uh, in contemporary philosophy. And then, of course, the other truths uh, are called um, synthetic. Um, so, for example, 
the claim that nothing is both round uh, and square would would count as um, an, a conceptual truth or an analytic truth on this sort of uh, view. It, it's not supposed to be a discovery about how the, the world is, but simply an expression of the rules of our language. Um, <clears throat> And it's also going to be part of this view that that changing the rules of a language changes the meaning of the relevant expressions because uh, their um, meaning is constituted by the rules. And so, it, in effect, it's a new language after the change. I mean, it might have quite a lot in common with the old language, but still, strictly speaking, it's a new language. Um, and then someone who challenges a con conceptual truth, um, for example, by insisting that some things are round and square. Um, the idea is that they're not disagreeing factually with other speakers of the language, but in effect, what they're doing is just proposing to change the rules of the language. And, and, and there may be uh, practical reasons for or against uh, making such a change, but it, it's not because the, the, the change is, is somehow one from an inaccurate way of speaking to an accurate or from an incorrect to a correct way of speaking. It's just uh, that speaking a, a new, in, in a new kind of language may, be, um, may better serve, uh, for example, the purposes of science. Um, And of course, we've got to be uh, careful here because um, words are not all uh, ambiguous. They, they may have uh, different uses um, and uh, such that they are subject to one set of rules uh, in one use and, and to a different set of rules in another use. May, maybe, um, well, I'm sorry, the word, I said the word has different meanings in these different Rules. I mean, what I mean is that, that uh, the, the word has different meanings, you know, in a context in which one set of rules is operative uh, from a con the, the meaning that it has in a different context where a different set of rules is uh, operative. Um, and then the sort of work that it is supposed to be left on this view for philosophers to do is that they can um, clear up apparent disagreements. Uh, by showing that the the two sides um, are using the same expression subject to different rules um, and and so that there was no factual disagreement, um, just a misunderstanding what one side was asserting was not what the other side was denying. the two sides were talking past each other and uh, philosophers might also um, use uh, this kind of uh, technique. Um, to uh, clear up uh, philosophical uh, paradoxes and uh, puzzles, um, because uh, if people, in using um, a given expression, are are not consistently separating different sets of rules that it can be used according to in in different contexts, and that they're somehow. Um, combining the rules that it's used uh, according to in one context with the rules uh, that it's used according to in another context, and as we're lumping all those rules together, then then the result um, might well be some kind of uh, inconsistency or contradiction. And then it would be the philosopher's job to, to dissolve the supposed philosophical problem by uh, explaining what had been going on. Um, now, a lot of the time, rather than talking about words in this sort of connection, um, you find uh, philosophers talking about uh, concepts. And in fact, uh, that was already implicit in the uh, terminology of conceptual truth that I was mentioning a couple of uh, slides back. Uh, so I, I, I want to say something 
about the the relation between um, words and uh, and concepts. Um, because often it seems that what we're facing is not a linguistic turn, but something like a conceptual turn, although the, the difference is not huge, in fact. Um, so if we've got two words uh, which are subject to the same rules, um, for example, the word red in English and the word rouge in French, which uh, is just a translation of red into uh, French, then um, if that's the only difference between them, it's it's not uh, philosophically significant. It, we're, we're not interested in saying the kind of thing about red that we could not say about uh, rouge. Um, and so in order to, to focus on what's um, philosophically interesting, to, we want to abstract away from the difference, such as the difference between uh, red and rouge, and um, and one way of of making that step of abstraction is by saying that the two words express the same concept. Um, and and so the the idea is that, that we're fo we're abstracting away from the uh, phonetic uh, properties of the word itself and looking just at fundamentally at the implicit. Uh, rules that it's used according to, which are supposed to be the same between red and uh, rouge. Um, and um, and then if we've got the same word, which is subject to different rules in two different contexts, then we will say that it expresses different concepts uh, in those con contexts. And uh, a lot of the um, the philosophical moves which you know, are associated with the phrase, the linguistic turn, they can also be rephrased in terms of concepts. Um, and so philosophers, you know, can be tasked with clarifying or analyzing concepts and tracing uh, conceptual uh, connections where we, we might have talked about them clarifying or analyzing certain words and tracing uh, linguistic uh, connections. But um, this is meant to be, as far as philosophers are concerned, the same sort of activity. Um, and of course, a, a lot of um, this activity uh, was traditionally associated with the idea of uh, conceptual analysis. And uh, because of the use of um, the phrase analytic philosophy, I mean, that sort of natural to for people to assume that uh, analytic uh, philosophy is in the business of producing uh, conceptual analyses, e even though, in fact, if you look at contemporary analytic philosophy, that is not such a, a central uh, task anymore, but it certainly was at one time. Um, so when we're talking about um, conceptual uh, analyses, uh, what we're talking about is I take it the identity of concept, um, at least this seems like the, the, the most natural notion of, of what we're getting from a conceptual analysis. Um, and, and typically the way these analyses are expressed um, is with the, the, the concept being expressed by a single word on one side and by a complex expression on the other. So just to take the classic example, um, the concept bachelor is supposed to be identical with the concept unmarried adult male human. Um, notice that the if we were talking about the linguistic expressions, um, they're not identical. The, the word bachelor is um, is not identical with the expression unmarried adult male human. For example, um, the, the word bachelor begins with a B, but the, the expression unmarried adult, adult male human does not begin with a B. But, but we're abstracting away from those unimportant uh, differences. Um, and, uh, and then we're getting the, as we're, we're analyzing the concept by showing that it, it can be expressed in terms um, 
and as it were, roughly speaking, in, in simpler uh, terms. Um, and, and then we might express this concept identity according to this sort of view of conceptual analysis based by saying something like to be a bachelor is to be an unmarried adult male human, where when we're not explicitly talking about concepts, but the idea is that we're Im implicitly talking about them. And we might even just say something like every unmarried adult male human is a bachelor. Um, and, and of course, vice versa, that every bachelor is an unmarried uh, adult male human, where we just seem to be dealing with an ordinary uh, extensional ge generalization. But the, the idea is what, what is really going on uh, is the expression of this um, conceptual analysis, which itself it just has to do with uh, the, the rules governing uh, the term bachelor um, uh, being tied to the rules um, governing the unmarried adult male human. Now, the, when people talk about conceptual connections, as for example, Strawson did, they're typically are talking about uh, conceptual truths which do not take the form of conceptual uh, analyses. So for example, uh, to use one that we had before, uh, if you say nothing is both round and square, um, that is, uh, that's not, a conceptual analysis of anything. It's not, it doesn't give you an analysis of, uh, of round in terms of square or of square in terms of round. Uh, I mean, round is not equivalent to uh, not square because all sorts of things are neither round nor square. Um, and uh, similarly, square is not equivalent to, to not round. But, but the idea is that uh, although this may not be um, a, a concept, a conceptual analysis, it's still a conceptual truth um, and it because it gives some kind of connection, in this case, the negative connection between uh, the concepts uh, round and square. And I mean, sometimes you get a narrower use of the term analytic so that it only applies uh, to um, things that take the form of uh, conceptual uh, analyses but it doesn't apply to uh, these con conceptual connections. But in, in contemporary philosophy, I think the, the word uh, analytic also gets applied to these, these broader conceptual connections. Um, and then it's in this connection, it's also worth uh, mentioning conceptual engineering, which is, is a kind of very um, trendy, uh, fashionable idea at the moment. Um, so conceptual engineering is supposed to be, if you at least taken at face value, it's a project of uh, constructing new concepts to serve some purpose, often by replacing old concepts. Um, and so in effect, the construction will involve devising new uh, conceptual rules um, uh, to, to, to govern this new concept, which, for example, might be more relevant to um, to current social conditions or, or more relevant to some new developments in science. So um, conceptual engineering is supposed to be something that happens a lot in science so that um, the, I mean, one engineered concept is the concept of a gene, which is, um, is required by uh, contemporary biology, but uh, was, uh, was not, used you know, 200 years ago. Um, but but we, we also get examples in uh, in politics, like the, the concept of cancer, cancel uh, culture, which is, has become uh, very um, much talked about in, in the last few months, in fact. And I mean, it's supposed to refer to the a sort of culture in which people who, who violate um, norms of political correctness uh, get cancelled in the sense that that you're not supposed to uh, invite them to to give lectures and that sort of thing, and then uh, and then another example of you know a, a concept which uh, is actually not so not as anything like as new as as the concept cancel culture is the concept kitsch for a certain kind of 
um, bad taste uh, art, maybe, for example, rather sentimental, uh, pretentious art. Um, so th these, these are, are cases where new concepts have been devised to meet new scientific or, or social or political needs. Um, so, so far I've just been describing um, the, uh, the sort of uh, views associated with a linguistic turn and with as it were, a, a conceptual uh, modulation of that. Um, and, and now I, I want to, to turn to uh, criticism of um, that way of thinking. Um, so even the very uh, contemporary um, talk of conceptual uh, truths and conceptual connections and so on, uh, if, if it's taken at face value, it fundamentally it depends on some version of the analytic synthetic uh, distinction, not the very narrow version of the analytic uh, that just corresponds uh, to uh, conceptual analyses, but to the, the broader notion, which is more like the notion of uh, conceptual truth. Um, and of course, such a distinction has been um, in some way problematic uh, since uh, Quine's uh, critique uh, of it into dogmas of empiricism, something like 70 years ago. Um, and, um, and of course, Quine was complaining that it's just it's quite unclear which truths are going to count as analytic or conceptual, uh, that uh, proper evidence is lacking for the rules of the kind that the, the theory of, of analytic or conceptual truths uh, posits. Um, and so just to give a, an example of why this is problematic, I mean, take someone who says that an adult male human who's been uh, separated but not divorced from his wife is a married bachelor, um, which of course violates these what are supposed to be the, the rules for using the term bachelor. And um, I mean, the, I mean, I'm not endorsing that view, but but I think it's it's the case that it's that there's we have not been provided with any proper method for determining whether he's violating a rule of the language or just challenging a common sense belief. I mean, you know, you, you, can, you can say, look, he's insisting that we use the, bachelor, the word bachelor in, in a new way. Um, but, but the person who says that may be um, insistent that uh, he's, actually, he's actually challenging, you know, a widespread belief that such a person is, that, that it's impossible to have a married bachelor. And that he thinks that there are examples uh, of this, um, and um, and you, you can you can find philosophers um, who are native speakers of English. I mean, people like uh, Gilbert Harmon and Robert Nozick, and so on, who are you know who are sympathetic to such uh, examples. So you know, it's it's very hard to to rule that somebody who who makes a claim like this simply doesn't understand uh, the word uh, bachelor, for example, um, because they it may be that you know by any normal standard um, that they're a completely fluent speaker of of English, and it, it does not seem appropriate to tell them that what they have to do is is to go back to language school, or not back to it, but but to go and take a course in uh, the speaking English. Um, But I mean, Quine's critique itself is not um, not really very satisfactory as it stands. Um, I mean, one way in which it's too radical is um, that that it attacks the idea of uh, synonymy um, because, for reasons which will uh, emerge. Uh, in a while, um, his his critique of a, the analytic synthetic distinction also requires him to criticize a number of related distinctions, and one of the, one of them is the distinction between synonymous and non-synonymous 
works. In other words, the distinction between uh, pairs of words which are the same in meaning and pairs of words which differ in meaning. Um, and, you know, if you, th- if you, I mean, forgetting about philosophers' commitments, if you just think about um, semantics as a branch of linguistics, um, the notion of synonymy seems um, fine there. It's one which is um, frequently used by linguists. Um, and, and it seems that any well-developed theory of meaning will, will give you um, some kind of definition of uh, sameness of, of meaning. So that, that, that if Quine's critique requires him to attack the notion of synonymy or sameness of meaning, then it actually seems to be clashing with what semanticists within linguistics are doing. Um, and it's also the case that a lot of Quine's critique depended on a behaviorist methodology uh, for the social sciences, where he, as where he was uh, looking for some kind of behavioral standard uh, for uh, synonymy. And, and that kind of behaviorist methodology um, has really been uh, outdated in both linguistics and in cognitive psychology since uh, Chomsky's um, famous critical uh, review of B.F. Skinner's book on linguistic uh, behavior in the late uh, 1950s. And so um, if you judge Quine's original critique by modern standards, it actually looks rather anti-scientific. And um, and so it, you know, it, it can't be considered as a definitive takedown of the analytic synthetic uh, distinction. Um, Now, suppose that we regard the the notion of synonymy of sameness of meaning as you know, a an a, an acceptable idea because it, it's just either implicit or explicit in a whole lot of what semantics as a branch of uh, linguistics. Uh, does I mean there might be different notions of synonymy, but but some notion of synonymy is going to be uh, available. Um, then the the critical question is um, is whether, given the idea of synonymy, we can use it to define an idea of analyticity, uh, because we need or, or analyticity in some broad sense of something like conceptual truth. Um, because um, the theory of concepts um, of the kind that I was describing before, it needs analyticity as well as synonymy because it needs the notion of conceptual truth and conceptual connections. So if we didn't have that, we wouldn't really have much uh, of a theory. Um, and so the, the question is, if we, t- if we take the idea of synonymy from semantics, can we use it to explain the idea of analyticity? And um, it was part of um, Quine's uh, critique to um, suggest that these two uh, go together. I, I'm never mind about the definition of synonymy in terms of analyticity, but he thought if we're given um, the idea of synonymy, um, we could define what it is for a sentence to be analytic um, by saying that. Um, for a sentence to be analytic is for it to be uh, synonymous with some logical truth. Um, so, for example, um, you know, if you take something like bachelors are unmarried, you know, uh, given that a bachelor is is supposed to be um, synonymous with. Um, unmarried adult male human, then bachelors are, are unmarried would just be something like um, adult, unmarried adult male humans uh, are unmarried, which would be a logical truth. And, and Quine was granting for the purposes of his critique that, that a precise um, idea of logical truth can be rigorously uh, defined. And, and so for Quine, um, he had to reject the idea of um, 
synonymous uh, sentences um, because uh, if he granted it, he thought that he would have to grant a notion of the uh, the analytic via this uh, definition. Now let's ju just focus on this uh, definition for a minute. The, so to be analytic is to be synonymous with a logical uh, truth. Now one very trivial consequence um, of this explanation of analyticity um, is that automatically any logical truth counts as analytic. And that's simply because um, any, any sentence is uh, synonymous with itself. And if so, if it is a logical truth, it's synonymous with a logical truth itself. Um, and so, as it were, logical truths um, get to be analytic according to this definition um, just for free. They, they don't have to really do anything or have any very special features other than logical truth um, to, to count as analytic. Um, but that doesn't really fit the... Uh, the kind of picture of analyticity or conceptual truth that defenders of the notion have tended to have, uh, or at least we need to, to check whether it fits it uh, or not. Um, because the idea is that logical tr truths are not telling us anything very substantial there. Um, sorry, analytic truths are not telling us anything substantial. They're, they're just expressions of uh, rules, um, linguistic uh, rules. Um, and so the question is, well, is it the case that that if something's a, lo a logical truth, that it's automatically just an, e an expression of linguistic uh, rules? Um, and that, as I say, that doesn't really fit the standard account of logical truth. We're, and the standard account of logical truth is, is that it it's just some, uh, something that is... Um, true on all interpretations, uh, but all interpretations which, which preserve the intended meanings of a logical constant. So, for example, um, all frogs are frogs uh, is a logical truth, because the um, as long as you preserve the meaning of all and are, it doesn't really matter what, uh, what the meaning of frog is, I mean, even if we... Um, Rephrase, you know, we reinterpreted a frog to mean a dog or something, it would still be true because all dogs are dogs. Um, so if we look at a definition like that of logical uh, truth, um, it gives no particular epistemic or linguistic privilege to logical truths. Um, and one way of seeing that is to, to think of uh, certain sentences which are composed entirely of logical constants. They don't have any uh, non-logical um, terms in them. Um, and, and then for them, there's no difference between truth and logical truth because um, if, if, they, if they're completely made up of logical constants and we're preserving the intended meaning of all the logical constants, then we preserve the meaning of the sentence itself. And so the that we're not really looking at any interpretations except the original one of the sentence. And that's why uh, such a sentence composed in that way um, is true if and only if it's logically true. And I mean, there are examples of that. For example, a sentence, I mean, the sentence um, which, in a, which says in effect that there are uh, 20, at least 29 objects um, that... Um, that it can be uh, formulated in a way where it is composed entirely of logical constants. And since it's true, it's logically true, but it, it doesn't seem that it has any very obvious epistemic or linguistic uh, privilege. Um, and, and so it seems that, that Quine's explanation of analyticity in terms of, on his view, the equally problematic notion of synonymy it's not really uh, something that uh, a theorist who, who's in a friend of concepts should be adopting because uh, it's just um, presupposing a, 
that a certain status for logical truths, which really needs to be separately argued for in terms of, of showing that logical uh, truths themselves have this kind of um, expressive uh, status. Um, and so it, it, once we see that, it, I think it, it emerges that, you know, unlike synonymy, analyticity does not have a secure place in semantics as a branch of uh, linguistics. It's, it, analyticity is not something that just automatically um, comes out of, um, you know, an account uh, of, of meaning. I mean, you can get various notions that maybe, you know, certain notion of um, necessity or whatever that come out of an account of meaning. But, but, but and, and something like analyticity it is not really given you by a uh, standard uh, semantic account of a language. Um, but that's, that's worrying um, for um, the proponents of the linguistic uh, turn because... Um, and friends of analyticity, because if the linguistic rules that they're positing um, really existed, then they ought to be something which it, it turn up, I mean, are, are found by the linguists, because they're supposed to be just describing um, what, but, you know, it, how the language, in effect, works. Um, but the, the linguists are not working with notions like that on the whole. Um, so that uh, I think it's, that makes it doubtful that there are any of the kind of linguistic rules, or at least all of the kind of linguistic rules that they're positing, because uh, an investigation of the language doesn't really show up uh, such uh, rules. I mean, shows shows up various linguistic rules, but they, they don't seem to be the kind of rules that are um, Positive by um, friends of analyticity on the whole. I mean, you know, of course, different theories of linguistics differ a bit, but but um, the the notion of analyticity is not central to semantics in the way that the notion of synonymy is at all. Um, I think there's another different kind of reason for saying that synonymy in linguistics is also not what these theorists of concepts uh, need. Um, so uh, just to give an example of what I'm uh, talking about, um, let's take the English words furs and gorse, uh, uh, which are, uh, you know, as normally used, they're just synonyms. They're simply two different words for the same kind of plant. It's a kind of um, bush, um, which I know well because it, I was brought up in uh, Scotland where, where there's lots and lots of, of this uh, plant. Um, now, you could have a rational speaker who learns furs in summer in the normal way by just being shown um, some of these bushes and then learns gorse uh, in winter um, by being shown some of these bushes. But, um, but they might not know that, they, that they're talking about the very same kind of bush because um, the this bush it, it changes its appearance between um, I guess roughly between summer and and winter. Uh, summer it it has lots it's sort of green with lots of yellow flowers, and uh, in winter it's just brown with no flowers. Um, and and so although this speaker would count by an ordinary standards as competent with a natural kind term because you don't I mean you don't need to have lots of um, special uh, botanical knowledge to count as competent with a, with a botanical uh, term in ordinary language. I mean, the, the speaker might accept furs is furs and reject furs is gorse. Um, and by ordinary standards, furs is furs and furs is gorse actually have the same meaning because all we've done is to substitute uh, one word for another um, in the sentence. Um, which have this, the very same meaning. And since the meaning of the whole sentence is built up out of the meanings of the words in it, the, the, the two sentences have the same meaning. But um, nevertheless, the, uh, the speaker is taking um, different attitudes to these sentences, accepting one and rejecting the other. They think that these two terms refer to uh, a different sort of uh, plan. Um, 
and and it's not that they're being crazily irrational or anything like that um and and so it seems that in cases like this the the synonymy of the terms is actually um not cognitively available even to a speaker who's um by ordinary standards uh is competent uh with the with the terms and and you know most most of the time the the um friends of conceptual truths and so on they're just talking about the the ordinary meanings of their terms they're not they're not talking uh about them as used but as as scientific terms and um and so although Furs, and presumably Furs is Furs, counts as um, a, a conceptual truth. But, it, you know, it seems that for, for these speakers, Furs is Gorse does not count as a conceptual truth. I mean, they're not showing uh, some kind of irrationality or uh, linguistic incompetence by not accepting Furs is Gorse. Um, and, and so it seems that the ordinary standard of synonymy in linguistics is, is also not working the way that theorists of concepts uh, need it to do. And so they're not getting the support from linguistics that they might have hoped for. Um, so what I'm uh, suggesting here is that uh, the Quine's uh, conclusion was uh, correct, even though his argument for it wasn't. Um, that the analytic synthetic distinction and the terms concept, conceptual truth, conceptual analysis, and conceptual connection, they're not backed in the way they need to be by a plausible theory. They're not fit for purpose and should be abandoned. Um, so it, in other words, the investigation of language just doesn't reveal that uh, it's structured in the way that these kinds of theory require it to be. Um, and there just doesn't seem to be... A, a, a an effective uh, theory which um, is backed by the kind of evidence it would need to have uh, in order to to indicate these distinctions, and and since these distinctions are really needed um, for the uh, the account of philosophical method as conceptual clarification, it it should just be abandoned. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to give some further arguments for for that uh, conclusion that that we should not be thinking of philosoph ph philosophy as engaged primarily in conceptual clarification. Um, so one further um, point that's worth clearing up is that what was emphasizing. So although the method of philosophy as conceptual clarification was supposed to be based on rules, at least in the case of natural language, which are available to any competent speaker of the language, um, in practice, it, it wasn't that by using this methodology that uh, philosophers uh, could avoid the kind of all the, the, the disputes and disagreements that... that philosophy traditionally got into and could simply just uncontroversially just clarify what was going on. Uh, in practice, it involves just as much controversy um, as other philosophical methods. So it, it doesn't make uh, philosophy as were somehow um, any easier. Um, because it, you know, the trouble is that its appeals to alleged linguistic rules mask philosophical dogmatism as linguistic competence. So philosophers can just, they insist on uh, some philosophical claim um, by, by asserting that it's uh, a conceptual truth. Uh, and so that anybody who doesn't understand it is, is linguistically incompetent or, or who doesn't assent to it is linguistically incompetent. But, um, but there's, there's no real uh, basis for the, these claims. It's, it's actually... <coughs> Um, I mean, it's, it's not, 
it's not that we're reaching the kind of consensus that you would expect if we were really talking about the the rules uh, of uh, a game that we're all playing and that that all um, competent speakers are implicitly respecting. Um, another way of, of um, put thinking of the view that I've been talking about is, is that. Um, I mean, clarifying concepts was proposed as an alternative aim for philosophy, which was contrasted with gaining knowledge. Um, and, and, and so people who take this view, they often say that, um, that what philosophy provides is not knowledge, but understanding. And so I think it's worth pressing on this issue of what the, the distinction between understanding and knowledge is supposed to, uh, to be. Um, so, when you ask what the difference is supposed to be between understanding and knowing, um, what you're often told is that you can know, for example, that an event happened without understanding why it happened. Um, and it's, I mean, that's true, but there's, it, it commits, it commits a, a very bad methodological fallacy because um, the understanding why and knowing that they differ not only in the verb but also in what follows the verb um, and it might be that the that the main uh, distinction uh, is really coming from the difference between the that and the why rather than from the difference between the know and the understand um, and in fact that seems to be confirmed because, I mean, you can know that an event happened without knowing why it happened. Um, so, I mean, this word knowing why it happened requires knowing a further fact about it beyond just that it did happen. Um, and and so, so that seems to be the place to, to look at. And... Um, and it's also the case that there seems to be a very close connection with, between understanding and uh, knowing, because uh, you can't really you can't understand why an event happened unless you also know why it happened. If you don't know why it happened, then you don't understand why it happened. Um, and and it's not clear that you can know why it happened without understanding why it happened. So knowing why something happened, and or knowing why something more generally knowing why something is the case is in fact very close uh, to um, understanding why it's the case. Um, and it, you know, if you look at, for example, in English, the way that people talk about understanding, I understand that something is the case. It's it, it, the way it's used is very close to knowing that something is the case. It's just that normally we tend to use the word understand um, followed by the words why and how rather than um, much more than like that. Um, so I, I think this distinction between knowledge and understanding is not nearly as robust and robust enough to be useful in uh, defining a, a separate um, aim for philosophy that doesn't require uh, knowledge. Um, So I want now to say something a bit about the uh, clarification. And, um, and so we don't really need the whole ideology of concepts to talk about um, clarifying uh, words, for example, um, making explicit some ambiguity in them or something like that. Um, so without worrying about the about concepts, we can still talk about clarifying words. But um, clarifying one's terms is something that uh, happens all over the place. It's not just something that philosophers do. In, in most uh, academic disciplines, um, from time to time, people feel the need to, to clarify the terms that they're using, either to give them explicit definitions or at least to... <clears throat> Give them enough explanation to 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 make it clear what distinction they're using these words to mark or something like that, and then uh, other people have to do that too. For example, lawyers uh, often, 
I mean, if if they're drafting a new law or something, they they need, need to clarify words, um, oh, and words may need to be clarified in in a court case. And so, the, normally, these clarifications happen in response to specific theoretical or practical uh, difficulties, uh, because it, it, it's not it's not feasible that we just, as it were, work at making our language perfectly clear, because after all, the words that we're using to make the clarifications are themselves not perfectly clear. And uh, that, that doesn't seem like a realistic aim. What does seem realistic and sensible is where an, uh, some vagueness or unclarity or ambiguity in a word is causing trouble, that we, th- that we, we then, uh, for specific purposes, we, we clear up that unclarity so that we can use it more, you know, a more effective way. And normally, philosophers don't need to be called in for that. Um, in fact, um, you know, often the people who, who need who need to be called in are the people who are familiar with the subject matter. I mean, they you know they might be the scientists or the lawyers or whoever it is. Um, of course, it, it's also true that in the same way, uh, philosophers uh, sometimes have to clarify their words, but that doesn't make uh, philosophy. Uh, exceptional. I mean, maybe we do more of that than people in in, in other disciplines, but but it's it's not that we're we're the only ones who uh, who do it. Um, and we also have to ask: Well, what are the specific difficulties that philosophical clarification is responding to? Um, so normally the difficulties at issue are not, they're not usually practical difficulties. Uh, but, but then if they're theoretical difficulties, I mean, w- w- we're not needed most of the time by other disciplines to clear up their problems. It must be um, that with th- these difficulties, uh, these theoretical difficulties have arisen in philosophy itself. And so philosophy must be, you know, a theoretical discipline after all to, to have the need for clarification. I mean, it, um, you know, if if philosophy was just if if its only task was to clear up the mess that it itself makes, then I think it would be better just to abolish philosophy. But if 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 all it could do was to undo its own damage, then why have it in the first place? Um, So, you know, another way of thinking about this issue of clarification is to ask uh, how it's uh, achieved. And of course, sometimes uh, it can be achieved by explicit definitions. Um, But uh, explicit definitions are not going to help if we're dealing with terms that are so basic that they can't be uh, defined in even more basic terms. And that might well be the case it, with uh, some uh, terms that are important in uh, philosophy. But I think, you know, I think it's just for the sake of another comparison, it's, it's helpful to look at the case of um, the, the sciences of other disciplines. Um, and, and, I, and of course, the science with the highest standards of clarity of all, really, is is mathematics. Um, And, you know, at least the way that mathematics is standardly developed, the most basic term in it is probably the the, the symbol epsilon, um, um, which means uh, set membership. So X, epsilon, Y means X is a member of the set Y. Um, And... In mathematics, normally this epsilon it is not defined in other terms. So the question is, how is it clarified? Well, I, I think um, the best candidates for the kind of clarification that you need uh, in order to use this symbol are just the standard axioms of set theory. Um, and when you look at them, you see that they're, they're not even implicit definitions of of the symbol. Uh, They're just 
statements about it. So a, a typical example is a PSA, the power set axiom. And it, it says that for any set S, there is another set, well, it doesn't say it's another, but, but it always is, in fact, another, another set, P, P of S, whose members are all and only the subsets of S. Um, so you can take all this, you take a set, um, you look at all its subsets, which, and the subset relation is defined in terms of the membership relation. And then, and then there's a set can, uh, whose members are, are all those subsets of the original uh, set. So that's just a statement uh, made uh, about, about sets using the membership uh, relation. Um, but that's the way in which um, the membership relation in effect gets clarified in mathematics. <laughs> when people are introduced to set theory and to this membership relation, they, um, if things get, if, if we need anything more than a very kind of vague use of the term, then um, then we all have these axioms of set theory. Um, and, and of course the question, well, so how is it that, that just by laying down some axioms, we clarify a theoretical term? Um, and I think the thing is, what we're doing there is we're making clearer what forms of reasoning with the term are legitimate and what forms are not legitimate. Um, and you might think, well, that doesn't that um, make the axioms conceptual truths or something like that after all, so that we would be back to that conceptual approach. But in fact, that's not the case. Um, it doesn't preclude a competent speaker of the technical language from challenging an axiom. Um, and uh, you know, if, if somebody who's sufficiently um, expert in set theory proposes, for some reason, that there are counterexamples to the power set axiom, um, that certainly doesn't show that they that they don't understand this membership symbol. <coughs> it's just that that they think that that we will get a, you know a more plausible. Uh, theory of sets by denying this, this axiom. Um, so that we're not, we're not getting anything um, like a, a conceptual truth here, but we are getting um, accepted principles that, that do uh, clarify what, what arguments are going to be accepted, um, at least within this sub-community and what, what are not. And that, that really is uh, enough to, to get on with the, the mathematics. Um, so what examples like that suggest, which, which is, as I say, an example from the science, which is probably clearer than any other of how its most fundamental terms are explained. What they suggest is that basic terms are best clarified by providing informative theories involving them. Um, and so at, at this fundamental level, it looks as though clarification without theory building may be a self-defeating enterprise. Um, so as it were, there may be something fundamentally wrong-headed about the idea that um, clarification is an alternative aim uh, for uh, philosophy by contrast with uh, theory building, um, bec because clarification without theory building um, may, in the end, um, be a futile uh, enterprise, especially when we're dealing with fundamental to more basic terms, as we tend to be in philosophy. Um, and so, of course, that suggests that to the extent to which philosophy is involved in clarification, it had better also be involved in theory building. Um, and um, if philosophy builds theories, then it's, that makes it much more like other sciences. And, and then a further step, if, if we assume that the other sciences are ultimately a seeking knowledge, then uh, it would be plausible that philosophy too is seeking knowledge, although I haven't, I haven't given you an argument there for thinking of the other sciences as seeking knowledge, although it's pretty plausible in some broad sense. Um, we might then wonder about um, 
where that leaves what was being called conceptual engineering. Um, and in fact, if we take conceptual engineering at face value, it, it's going to inherit all the, the problems associated with the term concept. Um, but if we just forget about concepts and think about linguistic engineering, I think we can see that there is a genuine and important phenomenon there, uh, which is that we, we often need to introduce new terminology and notation to articulate new distinctions, <coughs> as it were, it becomes um, important to draw a certain kind of uh, line across uh, logical space, and then we, it, it's going to be useful uh, to um, to have a word for that line. And um, and I think the emphasis on the um, on the words themselves uh, is is actually quite useful here because visible aspects of a notation can make uh, a difference. It isn't all just to do with what with concepts are involved. Um, so, uh, you know, an example of the importance of a good notation, I think, is in the um, 18th century study of the calculus, um, where British mathematicians continued to use Newton's notation. Of course, Newton and um, Leibniz uh, discovered the calculus more or less at the same time and, and more or less independently of each other. But wh whereas the continental European mathematicians, they used Leibniz's notation. And uh, Leibniz's notation was, was more flexible than, than Newton's. And, uh, and this partly explains why the, the continental European mathematicians made better progress than the British ones. Um, and uh, you know, as uh, has been said, a good notation is like a good teacher. And so what we want is some, something that is just is perspicuous in writing down the things that we need uh, to write down. And, and that may, as I say, depend on even on visible features of the, uh, the notation. Um, and... Of course, choosing a good notation and making good distinctions is important in philosophy. Um, but contrary to what some philosophers have recently suggested, that does not mean that philosophical disputes should be understood as what sometimes called metalinguistic negotiation and you know, some kind of negotiation about what language we should speak. Uh, because sometimes the disputes over which distinctions are good are really about which distinctions carve at the joints um, in Plato's terminology. In other words, which distinctions, as it were, follow natural differences in the subject matter. Um, and it can also be that sometimes two ways of talking are, are logically incompatible uh, with each other, so that it, it can't be that as where they that both distinctions are okay, um, but but we can just need to mark them by different terminology. So, for example, um, you know, a language, and this, is a, this is a result that can be proved, a language cannot contain both a negation that behaves according to classical logic and a negation that behaves according to intuitionistic logic, where intuitionistic logic um, rejects the law of excluded middle that everything either is or is not the case. Uh, and because it, it turns out that if you try to have uh, these two um, negations in the same language, they would collapse into each other, and therefore they couldn't couldn't be that one behaved according to one logic and the uh, other according to a different uh, logic. So, so it's it's not just that the, here are different things that we could mean by by negation by the word not or something. Uh, it's that there is a real uh, theoretical dispute as to which logic is correct. Um, So the conclusion that we're being drawn to um, is, is that philosophy is a theory building discipline in principle, quite similar to other sciences. Although we need to bear in mind that the sciences are not restricted to the natural sciences. So they um, include mathematics as well as natural sciences. Mathematics is a science too. And, uh, and so the fact that philosophy is similar to the other sciences, it doesn't automatically mean that its method should be much more similar uh, 
to that of the natural sciences, because we also have to think about the, the method of uh, mathematics, which, of course, doesn't use experiments in the, the same kind of way as the natural sciences uh, do. Um, and the attempt to, to carve out a, um, a different kind of task for philosophy that wouldn't be like the task of the, the sciences uh, has not uh, gone well, as we've seen. Um, so just looking, looking forward uh, to, to lecture four, um, I mean, one obvious question is, well, if philosophy is like other sciences, um, what role do experiments play in it? And as I said, that's a, that's a kind of open question for, for, for all we've said so far, because, because we've got different precedents here. I mean, if, if it's like mathematics, the role will be very small. If uh, the role is like physics, the role will be very large. And uh, so in the next uh, lecture on Thursday, um, I'm going to discuss both uh, thought experiments and real experiments and the role that uh, they may play uh, in uh, philosophy. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be the interlocutor today. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Tim Williamson for his great talk. I'd thank Professor Tim Ball for his kind invitation. My comment consists of two parts. First, I will give a short summary of Williamson's talk. Then I will raise some questions which might need further clarification or with first discussion in their own right. Williamson starts with a crisis of aims and methods in philosophy. After scientific revolution, there seemed to be a mismatch between philosophy's traditional aims, that is, knowledge of the entity, and its traditional method, that is, a priori reflection. If such a mismatch really exists, then philosophers naturally have two lines of responses. They could either change their aims or change their method. But Tim's next lecture might be about an attempt on the second line. His next play focuses on by Fem's attempt on the first line. According to some philosophers, like Wittgenstein and Carter, and many others, the aim of philosophy is, is clarification of language or thought rather than knowledge of the entity. Clarification could take the form of this application, that is, clarification of words or conceptual analysis, that is, clarification of concepts. It is also permits a way out of the endless dispute of philosophers. However, Williamson argues that philosophy as clarification is as disputatious as any other kind of philosophy. Moreover, clarification becomes zero while it is not a response to specific difficulties in constructive theorism. And the most and relating kinds of clarification themselves involve further constructive theorism. In the end, generally, clarification requires new knowledge of the entity. Thus, the result of clarification involves no that contrast between philosophy and natural science. Williamson concludes that philosophy is a theory building discipline in principle similar to other science, including mathematics as well as natural science. Here's something I think about. Many of argues against philosophy as clarification, but he also admits that some clarifications, like choosing good notations or making good distinctions, are important in philosophy. So it is unclear what Williamson's final conclusion would be. This leads to my first question. So I have some questions for you. The first one is, what's your final view on the crisis of philosophy? Do you think there is no crisis of philosophy at all? Or just verification as philosophy is not a good enough response to it? This is the first question. The second question is, what, when you say philosophy's aim is knowledge of the entity rather than clarification, 
What do you mean by reality? What do you think of another way of distinguish philosophy from science? Such as, there is a saying that science studies facts while philosophy studies values. This is my second question. The third one is, when discussing the analytic synthetic distinction, you reject Quine's argument, but accept his conclusion. What do you think of two other responses? One is to replace the distinction with some other ones, such as Jakob Hindekar's distinction between zero information and non-zero information. If the concept of information makes sense at all, then there is clearly a distinction between zero information and non-zero information, no matter how you define the concept of information. Or like Wittgenstein's distinction between topologic or non-topologic. And the other response is to take, just take the distinction between analytic and synthetic as basic, just as what you do with the distinction between knowledge and ignorance. Yeah, this is my third question. And my fourth question is, the fourth question is, what is the relation between knowledge of the entity and the rebuilding? Is the rebuilding a necessary way to get philosophic knowledge of the entity? That's all of my questions. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, um, Zhao Ching, for, for those interesting uh, questions. So uh, let me... Uh, I think you had four. So let, let um, so the so the first question was really: Is there a crisis um, of method for philosophy? Um, I mean, one which uh, um, clarification is not a sufficient response to, and um, or, or is it that, that really there is no there's there's no crisis? Uh, at all, I th so I would I would I don't think that the the methodological problems uh, for uh, philosophy are bad enough to really to uh, any more to uh, for them to deserve the name of a crisis, but but I do think that that we have a uh, a problem in fully understanding um, what our role is in relation to to what the sciences uh, are doing, um, and I think to some extent the the problem is uh, created by um, a lack of self understanding. Uh, on the part of philosophers of what they're they're doing, um, and um, I th I think that um, if if philosophers have a, a wrong conception of of, um, of what philosophical activity uh, is, I, for example, that it's just clarification, then that itself is is liable to uh, to lead to a, a methodological. Genuine methodological problems because um, the what people think about their aims and methods uh, does have quite an impact on what their aims and methods uh, actually are, and and so I think if people uh, think that what they're doing is clarification, uh, then that is itself going to create problems for philosophy, given that that this uh, conception of philosophy doesn't doesn't really. Uh, work, um, but even if we put aside as were well, the aspects of the problem that are created by um, false models uh, of what uh, philosophy is or should be uh, doing, I think that I'm. Mean, I think it is a, a genuinely hard problem to fully to understand uh, what uh, philosophy is uh, is up to, and I, I mean I think. That um, there are various kinds of uh, indication 
uh, of, of, of what we're doing. And, um, you know, I think that if we think of ourselves as a, a kind of highly theoretical science, but not a, a specifically natural science, although not completely divorced from natural science either, uh, I, I mean, I think that's a, a step in the right uh, direction. But I, I think there's uh, a, a lot more to be done in uh, in the way of um, characterizing in what ways we're the same and in what ways uh, we're different as as other sciences and and I think there's also a lot more to be to be done in the way of actually um, following um, those those methodological ideas out in practice but I, I you know I, th- I think it's it, it's not the case that that philosophy i think philosophy is is i mean of a kind of traditional um armchair re- reflection kind i think it's actually in it's better off methodologically uh than many people think but i think it's all it also needs to um improve its its methodology so i mean we've got both an issue of of description and an issue of prescription but um so when, as I say, not not a crisis, but but some genuine problems about our methodology, both in theory and in practice. Um, and then I think your second question was about characterizing the the difference between um, philosophy and um, and other disciplines, and and I think one. Um, one way of characterizing that that you gave at least as an example was that it might be that as where other sciences study facts but philosophy studies um values um i i i don't i don't think that quite gets it but i mean you know it, it's true that philosophers are, are much more willing to to talk, um, you know, in in a fully engaged ways about um, values and about what what are correct or incorrect values or what to talk in normative terms. But um, well, uh, I mean, there's quite a bit of philosophy that is not really to do with values. I mean, for example, uh, metaphysics is mostly not about values. I mean, it. I mean, there, it's true that um that when we we're, we're doing the the metaphysics of ethics then we're talking um about values and their their place in the uh, in the world uh but but i think a lot a lot of uh, in fact most of, of uh the, the issues that are being discussed under the the heading of metaphysics um are are not uh issues to do with with values and um and i think it's also the case that, that that I mean metaphysics. Oh, sorry, that philosophy is not the only subject um, that studies values. I mean, it, you know, for example, um, social anthropology might be interested in questions about what values are held by by different groups of people, or something like that. Um, um, so, so I th- I think that. I, you know, I, th- I think that although that, that this, you know, that, that picks that way of contrasting with, I mean, it, you know, it, it corresponds to to some differences. I mean, quite important differences um, between philosophy and other stuff. But I don't, I don't think it it actually draws the line uh, in the the right place. And I, I think it's I, there's probably no simple formula that does draw the line in the right place because I think to some extent as well what happens uh what what gets classified as philosophy and, and what gets classified as something else ha- has to do with historical accidents about the way various disciplines uh, have have developed um and I, so I don't think as it were philosophy has very natural boundaries I mean I think it's obvious that that it tends to be interested in in issues at uh, of a very theoretical kind at a high level uh of uh generality and abstraction but i don't think 
that that's the definition of, of philosophy. Um, so the, I think the your third question was um, about whether there's some other way of um, drawing the line between um, the, the analytic and the synthetic. And, for, and I think as an example of that, um, you were suggesting maybe Hintiger's distinction between um, the uh, between zero information and non-zero uh, information. Um, I, I, I don't really find that helpful. And in fact, you know, if you look at the the history of um, discussions of information, um, that they it, they've had enormous problems in defining a a workable criterion of sameness uh, of uh, information, um, which, which would also, which is closely related to the issue of, of zero information. And and the trouble the trouble is that what you seem to be offered by such theories is really just a kind of stipulation about what's going to count as the same information and what's going to count as different information and and what counts as zero information and what doesn't. And uh, and it's one where where certain kinds of logical truths will count as uh, giving zero information, uh, and others uh, won't. Uh, something along those lines, and uh, it, it seems pretty arbitrary. And you know that um, I mean, which which truths uh, give you new information uh, d- depends on what your um, cognitive position happens to be in all sorts of um, maybe but quite idiosyncratic uh, ways, so that there are there isn't a natural divide between sentences which give no information and sentences uh, which give some information. That uh, it, that just depends on the the circumstances and the um, cognitive position of of the person to whom one's uh, speaking. Um, and then the. The final um, question, the fourth question that you asked, was whether theory building is needed for knowledge of reality. And I think also, I, I, actually, you were also asking what I mean by uh, reality. So rea- by reality, I just mean you know wh- whatever there is. Um, so what <laughs> everything. Um, so I think that there's plenty of knowledge, I mean, all knowledge is knowledge of reality, as well as nothing else to know, but um, there's plenty of knowledge that we can get without theory building, uh, you know, at at some kind of, at least at some sort of conscious level, maybe some theories are built into our cognitive systems, but we're we're not talking about that. Um, So I think, uh, as it were, a lot of common sense uh, knowledge um, is does not depend on theory building. And, you know, and I think even, you know, for example, some historical knowledge doesn't uh, depend on theory building. But I think when one is asking the the kind of abstract general questions that philosophy typically asks, uh, questions for which common sense doesn't typically have an answer, um, then um, I don't think there's an alternative to to theory building um, because uh, we've we've got to um, we've we need theories to tell us what the possible answers are and then theories to to give considerations uh, favoring them. So I think that as we're if if we're going to get knowledge of the things that philosophers have been interested in, I don't think there's any alternative to some kind of uh, theory building. But it, that's not because it's a prerequisite for all knowledge. It's because of the kind of questions that we're asking. Right. Thanks. Uh, firstly, I want to thank Professor uh, Chen Bro for inviting me and uh, uh, the introduction. And also thanks for Professor Williamson for this great talk, which is very uh, illuminating. Uh, Actually, I I just have uh, two questions. 
Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, uh, yes, it's it's okay. coming up. Okay, great. Uh, basically, my uh, my I have two questions. One is a small one. Another is a quite general. I think maybe uh, related with uh, other commentators, but I think maybe uh, maybe I, I ask it from a, a different uh, perspective. The first one, actually, uh, uh, concerning about the, the relation between understanding and knowledge, uh, which I think is very uh, crucial in uh, Professor Williamson's uh, today's talk, uh, the, uh, related with the clarification. Uh, uh, as Professor Williamson uh, claimed, the distinction between knowledge and understanding is not robust enough to be useful here. And I also quote uh, from his book, uh, he, in this passage, uh, he uh, uh, used two examples to support the point uh, that, uh, quote, the idea of increasing understanding without increasing knowledge is an illusion, uh, end quote. Um, uh, from my own understanding, uh, I, I have some reservations, actually, uh, because this point seems to be uh, doubtful. At first glance, there seems to be two types of relation between understanding and knowing. Type A, uh, that is increasing understanding with increasing knowledge. In empirical area, as the examples Professor Williamson mentioned, uh, I think this relation is true. But we, I think we also have another type of relation. That means uh, increasing understanding without increasing knowledge. Uh, in philosophical area, some cases are not just as same as in uh, empirical area. Understanding is based on knowledge system, but sometimes understanding uh, understandings don't increase along with the increased uh, knowledge. This is not to say there could be understanding without knowledge, but that they do not synchronize with each other. Uh, at, at this time, I think we can consider two cases. Uh, the first one is understanding philosophical questions themselves. Uh, for example, does time have special extension? How long is the Paris meter ruler? Understanding them is to recognize uh, whether some questions are nonsense rather than to produce new knowledge about them. The second case is understanding uh, specific contents of philosophical questions. For example, questions about the nature of truth, the meaning of life, uh, the nature of normativity, etc. Understanding them doesn't give us new knowledge, but it's to see them more clearly. In those two cases, understanding is much more like insight, and increasing understanding does not increase knowledge, but rule out misunderstanding. Uh, further, this actually introduced another question about the relation. Does the increasing knowledge lead to increasing understanding? Uh, there seems to be another two types. The type C, uh, that means uh, increasing knowledge with increasing understanding. Uh, examples, as Professor Williams, Williamson mentioned. Uh, so the fourth is type D, uh, increasing knowledge without increasing understanding. For example, in philosophy of mind, David Chalmers claimed that the hard problem of mind uh, could not be resolved by the, uh, by the scientific knowledge. Though there is a debate at this issue. For example, Jesse Prince claimed that if you get more knowledge about the neural mechanism of brain, then you understand better what man is. Uh, under these considerations, Professor Williamson's contention perfectly fits with type A and C, but leaving type B and D untouched. It. As for uh, his justification, example, uh, he used have their limitations since they only support type A and C. These empirical examples are different from examples as the truth, normativity, etc. Using them to, uh, to deal with type B and D may lead to a fallible analogy. Plus, if I understand Professor Williamson's idea correctly, and those four types make sense, it seems that both Professor Williamson's undervaluation of the distinction between understanding and knowledge and his conclusion that philosophy is a, a theory-building discipline in principle similar to other science uh, seem to be uh, doubtful. Uh, the second question is quite general. This may be, uh, as I said before, uh, related to the whole series of lecture, including such topics as disagreement, clarification, and the relation between philosophy and new, uh, natural science. Other commentators already raised a similar question, uh, I'm sure, but I hope mine may ask it differently. Uh, when we think about philosophy itself, uh, namely mind philosophy, uh, where is the start point? In many cases, Philosophy do disagree with each other about the nature of philosophy. In this case, what kind of argument could be useful 
to address this big question. It seems that there are two different cases in practice deserve to mention. Uh, the first one for beginner, uh, most likely they may start philosophy without a ready argument, but just do it due to their education system, ideology influenced by senior, intuition and flavor, etc. But those factors are like causal explanation, not reason justification. I assume in this case that cause is not identical with reason. In other words, uh, those explanations are not philosophical. So should we who worry about this issue still wait for a strong reason to be found or just consider the reality, namely doing philosophy blindly, since there is no final de decisive answer to the reason? For mature thinkers, they are preconceived idea for both sides of argument, especially in a radical case than a moderate case. For example, a weak, Wittgenstein would not agree that philosophy is constructive because they see philosophy as a curing disease, while others, like Professor Williamson, do not agree that philosophy is deconstructive because they, are, uh, philosoph they see philosophy as personal knowledge. In these cases, is there any jury who doesn't have any preconception Putting it more simply, is it possible for philosophy to start without bias? Is common sense enough on addressing this kind of question? I think I take, uh, take too much time. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so, so let me take your uh, two questions in, in turn. So one, one had to do with cases where um, we we understand a question uh, better. Um, and you were stating these are cases where the increase um, in understanding doesn't go in, in with an increase in, in knowledge. But, um, you know, I think w w when we start unpacking um, w what, um, w what this increase in understanding is, I I, I think we're going to find that it involves knowledge. But so, for example, um, you know, at, at the most um, basic level, um, you know, understanding a question is a matter of knowing what the question means, um, and that's you know, that's knowing what, which is a that's actually a, a form of propositional uh, knowledge. I mean, there are, of course, th that's not the only way in which we might understand a question better. I mean, we, we might. We might understand uh, it, it better by by learning um, what the the point of the question is, why why it's worth asking. But then, we're, we're, what we're doing is we're gaining knowledge of why it's worth asking, um, and um, and we might also you know understand it better by understanding its connection to other questions uh, better. But that might involve just learning. That it has such and such uh, connections um, with other questions, um, and again, that's that's gaining knowledge. Um, and then um, the I th in, another kind of example you're giving was ones where we we might we might learn that a certain question uh, is um, well, we might come to understand that a certain question is is meaningless. Um, and um, I, I, th I, th I think you were giving the, uh, the question, how long is the, the Paris um, meter ruler um, as a, an example of a meaningless uh, question? I mean, I don't myself agree that it's meaningless. I think, I think it's just that... It, um it's um it's kind of trivial that the answer is it's one meter long um and and i think that's a, it will be implied by a, any proper theory of of length but but i mean suppose we did have a a, a genuinely meaningless uh question um i think um well, it, if it's meaningless, it's not that you can understand the question better, but you can understand something about the question better, which is you can come to understand that it's a meaningless question. But I think that's also a matter of uh, coming to know that it's a meaningless uh, question. Um, and, you know, and so, I, you know, I, those are the kind of moves that I'd be making about, you know, to 
sort of probing this these increases um, in uh, understanding. Um, and um, and I you know I make some with some of the other examples that you that you gave as well. But I th- I think one thing that was interesting was that, that you compared understanding uh, understanding better to seeing something more clearly, which um, is I mean I think that's a it's a perfectly good metaphor, but um, I think seeing something more clearly um, means uh, I mean what it involves is being um in in a position to gain i mean if we just take it literally we're in a position to gain more knowledge about something when we see it more clearly i mean for example um you know if we see you know if if we see somebody through the mist and, and when they come more um uh when when we start seeing you know as they come closer we see them more clearly and and then we may be able to recognize who it is or you know even if it's a stranger we you know, because we see them more clearly, um, we, we we gain knowledge, you know, whether they're a man or a woman, what clothes they're wearing, what color hair they have, all those kind of things. So that actually, I think the, the metaphor of seeing more clearly uh, suggests a very strong connection uh, with, uh, with knowledge. Um, then, so that, that's what I'd say about your first question. About the second question, which was, uh, so that was to do with, what kind of um, reasons we might have uh, for doing philosophy, um, and and also whether there's a, some kind of um, unbiased jury, um, you know, who could adjudicate these uh, disputes. Um, so I, you know, I think. I mean, it may be that there that there is not a completely unbiased jury that um, that ev- you know it, that in order to understand what's at issue between these different conceptions of philosophy, um, you you have to be trained to some extent in philosophy, and that training itself will will. It involves some kind of bias to one view or or another, and um, you know, and I think, but I don't, I, I don't think that's such a terrible situation to be in because uh, you know I think that the right way of um, resolving it is is not um, really just to have you know as one. Um, as a shootout where we try to um, decide once and for all uh, which conception of philosophy is better. I, th- I think uh, it, it's it's more appropriate just to let proponents of each view of philosophy um, develop develop their view as as best they can by doing philosophy in in the way they they think appropriate um, and. You know, and then I think um, in the long run, it, it often becomes, you know, it typically becomes clear that, that, you know, that one of these views is actually making some progress and the other is just stagnating. Um, and, you know, I don't, in fact, think that this is very different from um, from the situation um, in, you know, in, in, say, in the natural sciences. I mean, it, you know, if, if suppose that we have... Um, you know, let's say two research uh, programs in physics or something like that. Um, I mean, the only the only people who are in a position to adjudicate between them will be people who have um, who are very extensively, very well educated in physics to understand what both research programs involve. And uh, and once they're in that position. Um, it's almost certain that um, that the kind of training that they've uh, received uh, will bias them in one uh, direction or another, and so um, you know, I don't, I don't think that we should expect, um, you know, even in the case of physics, so to be a neutral jury which can just decide. Um, what I was suggesting in the case of uh, both. 
philosophy and the natural sciences is that the the mechanism is a more long term one in which um as you were the in the end the de- the decision is made by people as to which research program they're going to uh to work on and and some research programs are able to uh, to renew themselves and to you know produce new re- um, as were well, recruit uh, new members and and so on and uh and others you know just tend in the long run to 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 dry up or although <coughs> often i mean they will continue to get some uh, adherence for a, a, a long a long time um and uh, you know and that's that's achieved not by um some completely decisive um argument you know but by but by each each side being given um the the chance to to develop its approach and you know i mean for example in the in the case of the the conceptions of philosophy as clarification i mean those are conceptions which which were given um a you know a long a long run uh in 20th century uh philosophy and you know and i think the uh the fact that they weren't really able in any uh effective way to substantiate uh let's say the distinction between conceptual and non-conceptual truths or something you know that that they you know they had they were given their opportunity and they, they couldn't take it you know in the long run i think that is the kind of consideration which will tell uh against them but but you know i agree that if this is what you're suggesting that there is no such thing as as some uh completely unbiased a uh, jury which as it were understands enough of the alternatives uh to uh to be able to uh, be the judge in the case but i don't i don't actually think that we need such a, a judge <laughs>